applicable. So speak of the Karokan. Let's take a look at a Karokan game. So the person playing white here is Karawana. And the person playing black is Bereev. And this happened in 2016. I thought it was the Olympiad, but it's actually from a tournament in Baku. So you guys can look it up if you want. It's a Karokan, which is like the poster child of having no space, for, uh, honestly. All right, so Ari mentioned that he did beat me in a Karakon, but yes, it was a simul game. So I made a lot of blunders in my, my simul games. I think that in a heads up game, if you decide that you're gonna play Karakon and I know it, I'm gonna crush almost anyone every single time in the Karakon as white. Love it. Um, so Karawana played E5, and this is very popular at the top level still, even in 2020, four years later. And it's a space grabbing operation. And it's the same pawn structure for white, just so you know. It's very similar, so it says something to the general applicability here. And so in this game, Borea put his bishop on f5, which is normal in the Karokan. But we, we shouldn't just take it like normal in the Karokan. We should think about what it means. So in the other opening, we saw that black wanted to play bishop g4 and trade for a knight in order to better attack the pawn on d4. But here, black hasn't even really tried to attack d4 yet. So this is a more slow burning strategy. Black is kind of saying, I have enough space for my pieces. I'm gonna break your center later. It turns out this is very risky. So Caravana just developed his pieces. Do you guys think bishop d3 is a good alternative? Any ideas about this? Should white play bishop d3? Ari, you flatter me. Maybe I wouldn't crush you in any opening. I even lost to Mahir in the bird opening. Mahir said the best move is c5 or bishop f5. I'm suspicious of c5, this Karokan gambit. Let's take, a, let's take a look at that for a second. I'm suspicious of this because it's like a tempo down version of something. And I think that c4 is a really interesting move in this position, but it's super chaotic. I'm not sure how to explain it shortly. So bishop d3, was it good? Okay, Ari brings up a good point. He says that this bishop on d3 is white's good bishop, and this is black's bad bishop. So we shouldn't trade them. On one hand, that makes sense. However, this is also black's active bishop. So there's a balance here. The way I would look at this is that the pawn structure is kind of closed. Black has less space. So even if I want to trade this bishop eventually, I'm not gonna do it right now because it will alleviate their space problem. So whether it's a good bishop or a bad bishop, I don't care that much. I mostly care about the space. So bishop d3 is actually not good. A lot of lazy people play this line. They're like, yay, I got a tempo with the queen, but then black's gonna get their c5 break so easily. It's not really useful. Um, probably the best move here is knight d7. It might even be queen a5. This is a common thing in another variation of the Karokan. I seem to remember something with like queen a6, trading even more pieces. This is actually a nice maneuver. But Don, I'll, I'll see how I feel about accepting challenges at the end. Maybe. Um, I might be too tired, but we'll see. So bishop e2 is good. And here, Black played bishop g6. I think bishop g6 is a weird move. I don't remember what the best move is. Usually I think they play knight e7 or something like that. I think this is usually what's played in this position. But after bishop g6, um, it's white to play and we have some decisions to make. We have to keep using these pieces somehow. We have some ways to improve our position. We have to plan out the future, right? So. What do you guys think white should play here? Mahir says that French is a better Karokan. I think that is not true. There's, th there's this uh, line of reasoning that whichever opening is the most active is the best. If that's true, Scandinavian defense is a better version of French defense, isn't it? So Karokan is like the most passive in the Slav structure. And then the French is like Actually, no, maybe the French is like the most passive with the bishop stuck inside. And then Karokan is like maybe a little more active than the French. 
and then Scandinavian is even more active than Karakan, and they're all the same pawn structure. But in practice, it turns out it's not true. All right, Yidermaster says c4, interesting. Vedan says bishop g5, also interesting. All right, so lots of people are saying c4. I'd actually like to address c4 and bishop c5. So c4 looks like you're grabbing space, but it allows them to exchange a pair of pawns. And this would allow them to occupy the d5 outpost square. So you're, this is actually a strategic error, I would say, in, in this case. So actually, I think Yidermaster made this error in the last example as well, saying that we should play like c5 to kick the knight, and then it ended up coming to d5. So Eater Master, be careful about giving your opponent unnecessary good outpost squares. C4, I would say no. Bishop G5 also doesn't make sense. Maybe you think that this is your bad bishop, and if they trade, you're trading for their good bishop. But you're also alleviating their space problems if you make this exchange. Like, let's say you take... Black space issues are kind of disappearing right in front of your eyes. All right, Vedant is on, on the right idea now, a4. So this is a way to gain space in a meaningful way um, without giving any extra chances to black. And we'd like to advance to a5. If we advance to a5, they won't be able to play knight b6 and knight c4 or anything like that. And if we play a5, we'll also prevent them from playing a5 and we'll prevent queen b6. A lot of moves are going to get taken away by the a5, a4 advance. All right. So, in the game they played 97, I believe that knight h6 is the main line here. But, I think it's a relatively small difference. Alright, so what do you guys think white should play in this position? They play 97, developing a new piece, but not challenging white center at all. Ari wants to play knight c3? Okay. So, if you're going to play a move like knight c3, you have to decide, is it okay to block this pawn? So, Ari, do you think that the C-pawn has any um, influence on your long-term strategy? Does it matter if we use the C-pawn or block the C-pawn? Vedant wants to play rook to a3. That looks suspicious to me. Like, where are you lifting to? Vedant's a5 move is good. So... After a5, we're getting even more space at basically no cost. And this is space that we can easily maintain. So, um, how should we continue from here? In the game, they played a6, but this is a really major concession. Yeah, knight c3 is very committal. The reason it's committal to play knight c3 is that we would like to play either c3 to stabilize our space advantage or to eventually break and open a line once we have a really big space advantage and we want to make our rooks better. So we shouldn't burn that bridge with knight c3. It might be hard to maneuver it around again in order to play c3 or c4. So a5 is very non-committal, but also very strong. So a6, you should remember this pawn structure. This formation is very poor for black. They can't advance any of these pawns and they have a weakness all on one color. So white now has the option of either attacking all the light square pawns or occupying all the dark squares. Frequently these two things will go hand in hand. So a6 I would say is a blunder actually already. And if black ever wanted to get in b6, they would certainly need the pawn on a7 to accomplish it. Um, let's see. I think I wrote some notes here. Give me one second. I just want to see if I have an interesting note to a6. No, I don't think I wrote anything that's super important. So, anyway, they played a6. Their structure is really bad. How do we um, increase our space advantage? Oh yeah, Yeter Master wants to talk about b6. So let's talk about this. Um, well, first of all, I don't know if taking the a-pawn is actually that threatening. Because your pawn on a5 would become really weak, and the pawn behind it would become really weak too. This is a really common motif. 
I'm even considering playing a move like a6 for more space. I'm a little bit concerned that the a6 pawn could get overextended though. So maybe in this position I would play... Alright, the move that I would play here is probably a giveaway. I would play b4 here, I think. But the idea is not to take with the pawn, the idea is to take with the rook. So here's another space advantage kind of thing. Whenever someone has a, a pawn that's like way far back on an open file, and you can attack it from the from the front with the heavy pieces, that pawn is almost generally doomed in the end game. So this can be very useful to one side. We'll play c3 to support our b pawn, and we'll just hammer the a pawn into the end game. Black will either have to remain very passive to defend it or lose it. So in the game, they play b4 right away after a6. Yeah, the idea for black is to play c5. So b4 is actually stopping c5 forever. Notice that if you play b6 here, after pawn takes b6, we get the same pawn structure, which is favorable to white. So in the game, they played knight f5. And white played c3. You can remember this formation as a mnemonic device. V for victory. This pawn formation against this pawn formation is very strong for white. They're staking out much more territory, and in particular, these two pawns are doing a great job of stopping black's only active play, which is c5. They'll never break, and as long as they don't get in a pawn break, like what I talked about in my other video entirely about pawn breaks, they won't be able to free the position for their pieces, they're going to suffer a lack of space. So this is a good example of extension without overextension. Caruana just improved his position in small increments. Like the first part, he established in the first couple of moves. He established just two pawns in the center, not four. Something he could easily maintain. And then he supported it with pieces as much as he needed to. It was never really under attack, but... I guarantee that Bereyev would have started attacking the pawns if he played ambitiously with f4 or c4. But since he didn't do that, black had no reasonable way of doing it. Then he improved his a-pawn, then he consolidated his a-pawn and prevented black's counterplay, and then he consolidated b4 and d4. Alright, so Yudermaster wants to see what happens if instead of a6 they play c5. Okay, so I think in, in this case, we would just play the move c3. So you do get in c5, which is maybe better than before. But you also might not have a very good follow-up. Because this pawn structure, if you trade on d4, is kind of miserable for black. Usually a symmetrical pawn structure where you can't trade uh, pieces in a meaningful way is really sad. Like here, white has a lot of space. Pawn structure is symmetrical. You can't really trade any of your problematic pieces. Like you can play bishop takes b1, but then your only active bishop is getting traded. That's not good. Um, this pawn structure is also quite good for white, I would say. If white didn't have a light square bishop, like if we traded these two bishops on e2 and g6, then I think that black would be doing just fine. But that's not the case. Oh, after b6? Okay. So here with b6, and then b4, and then c5. Hmm. This might get tactical. Like, let's say we just take it. If you take back... I'm a little hesitant to do this, but I think you can't take the C pawn. No, there's got to be a better way than this. All right, this is a good question. Maybe c3 is fine. If you trade on d4, it's just the same pawn structure. So the critical test would be this one. 
Well, actually, no, it's the same position. What am I saying? So, whatever you do, right, we're going to get this pawn structure. You could... I'm not sure how you can pressure this pawn. I think that's the only reason that you would play b6 and c5. You would play b6 to provoke b4 and then c5 to try to undermine it, right? But where's the pressure? I don't see anything. Like, knight c6 is met by... Well, I was thinking it would be met by b5, but knight takes a5 is possible. So maybe there's some small pressure. But after knight c6, I think I can attack and defend like this. Knight takes b4 looks a little dangerous because of pawn takes b6, something like that. Or maybe I could take and then play b5. I, this is a lot more interesting than what happened in the game, for sure. I guess I just have to say I'm, I don't really know. I, I get the feeling overall that white is just better in all these lines, but it does look like counterplay, and in the game, um, Bereyev got crushed, so it, it could be better than what he did. So this is very interesting. I'll probably check it out a little more later. So he made this big concession. You know what? Maybe we can read Bereyev's psychology. Maybe he played a6 because he was worried about a6. So maybe my vote for b4 was actually wrong. I was worried about this pawn getting overextended, but it's protected by the bishop. The only way you can prevent that is with b5, or c5 and then c4, which is a bit of a stretch. Maybe this is just a simple solution. Like, if you play c5 here, now we just play c3. Even if you play c4, usually completely locking the structure when your opponent has more space is not helpful. Besides, we can always open the position with b3 if we really want to. I think a6 is maybe more precise than b4. So this was a, a good side thing. Um, I think we can kind of say that a6 is better in order to avoid c5. Makes sense, because c5 is black's only break. If they can play it, generally they're going to be okay. Alright, so they played a6, b4, then c3, making this v for victory formation. And black tried to undermine it with f6. This is a classic way of trying to deal with a space problem. So let's see, how would you guys deal with this challenge to your space? How do we support our structure? What's the good move for white? By the way, Vedanta, I, I forgot to acknowledge your comment. In the position where um, white has doubled C pawns, knight C6 is definitely a, a good move. You were correct. So they're just threatening to take twice on E5. How do we deal with it? Well, they're not threatening to take twice. They're threatening to take and then apply pressure with like queen c7. All right, Eater Master, I think you just typoed. Yeah, bishop f4, that's correct. Bishop f4, so we can always maintain a piece on e5, even if they challenge us. So he traded. How should we take back? This is actually a tricky moment. I was maybe misleading when I said we should be able to take back with a piece on e5. That makes it sound like we want to use e5 as an outpost, but there's another option which is quite good. The other option is d takes e5, of course. The reason that it's not knight takes e5 here is that this alleviates black space problem. So in this case, trading pieces to alleviate space is more important than having the outpost square. Here, black would just play bishop d6, and everybody's going to come off the board. We can shake hands, even though there's a weak pawn on e6. Black should be able to hold just one weakness. 
Actually, no, I think this endgame is also quite unpleasant for Black, now that, now that I look at it more closely. Um, because they still have this weakness on b7. This pawn, this uh, king and pawn endgame could be lost. Yeah, actually, I think this is also maybe better for white. But d takes e5 is just refusing 100% to trade any of the pieces. And in addition, we could use the d4 square in the future. The only thing we have to check out is that we're not losing the e-pawn. So they play bishop e7. This is where it gets tricky, because we've improved our pieces almost as much as we can. If we give black time, they're going to break down our center. So how do we deal with that? I'll give you a hint. There's still a way that Caruana can grab space. All right, Eater Master, if you play knight d4, they will trade their knight for yours. And you'll be slightly better, but only slightly. Vidan wants rook e1. Rook e1 supports e5 more, but it's a little passive. There's a way to gain some space and also prevent black from making any advances. I guess black wants to play h5, something like that, to try to get some counterplay. Because the queen side's totally frozen, so their only pawn break would be like h5, g5, that kind of thing. All right, Ari got it. It's g4. And I think this is a great move. It deserves an exclamation point. Because it looks like you're weakening your king, but since black's pieces are so cramped, especially like these rooks who will never do a thing, um, it doesn't really matter that your king safety is compromised. Just don't trade down into a position where they can attack your king and you're fine. So they play knight h4, offering an exchange. That's another reason to play bishop e7. Ari, this is not dubious at all. Vedant, this was Caruana versus Berea from 2016. g4 is not dubious. It's a great position for white. When your opponent doesn't have active pieces, you can do almost anything you want. All right, what should we do? So Vedan says knight a3. So Vedan doesn't seem to, to get the thing that we shouldn't trade too many pieces if we have a space advantage. We still have a space advantage, and it, it's growing by the minute. So let's not trade one pair of knights. If you trade a pair of knights, they'll have more room for the other knight. If you leave it on the board, they're going to compete for squares long term. So how do we avoid exchanging knights? That's kind of the crux of the issue. Knight d4, absolutely. White has an advantage because now their, their pieces are just scattered to some different squares and we're attacking the, the weak e6 pawn. So they play bishop f7 so they wouldn't lose it. You can probably guess from bishop g3 what move is getting prepared here. And Boreyev played h5, which is a desperate bid for some space, and makes a lot of sense, but it's a pawn sacrifice. So now white has a space advantage and a material advantage. White should be able to win. Next, he played queen c7. And in this position, I would say that Caruana found a nice way to improve on things. This is a tactical moment. Now that black is playing sharply to try to get the pieces active, let's think tactics. What should white do to make some tactical opportunities? Also, also sorry, but I didn't know knight a3 was an earlier comment. There's maybe some delay. All right. So now that we have lots of space and everybody's happy, we have to deal with knight takes e5, and we also have to try to improve our pieces. All right, f4 is interesting. It bolsters e5, it prepares f5, 
But if you play f5, you're just trading for a weakness. You're not actually going to win the e6 pawn. e6 is really weak. We should want to capture it. So the way that we would accomplish that, Eater Master, Rook e1, no. The Rook's already better placed on f1. We would want to play f4 eventually, but first let's try to win e6. Think about it. If they take with the knight, the knight's going to be pinned. That's not great, is it? So we, we actually have a free hand in this position. We can let them take that pawn. All right. Oh, so Ari was thinking some kind of discover attack on e6. But f4 also weakens our king a little bit. We might get run into some counterplay with b6 if when their queen arrives it attacks our king. It might justify some of the anti-positional moves that we were talking about before, if our king is open. Vedant got it. Bishop g4. We're just threatening to take the e6 pawn. This position's plus minus. White is just completely winning. If they play knight e5, um, I think just rook e1 now is winning. Wait, hold on. I'm drawing a blank here. I think bishop takes e6 is probably the strongest. Just... Let him have it. Mm, actually, maybe bishop takes h5 is possible. So knight e6. Okay, what do you guys think? I'm actually having some doubts. What's the best move here for white? If they take on e5, how do we beat them? Rookie one still looks pretty good, honestly. Probably it's it's a moot point. Um, the only concern with rookie one is that they could play bishop d6, but then knight e6 is even stronger than before. Um, one idea that I had is that if they take to deal with the threat, we can play some discover attack if they move the knight. So we might play like f4 only at this critical moment when we're winning a piece, and then like bishop d5, something like that. Yeah, I think everything looks good, so let's not dwell too much here. So in the game, he played rook h6, and after f4, they finally got c5, but it's kind of too late. Notice that they can't play queen c3 because of rook c1. So this is kind of just the conversion step. White's up material. They have lots of space still. Black's pieces are awkwardly placed. So he, he just chose a, an easy way to win a piece. Queen e1. The knight's trapped. So the rest was just like this. Actually, this is sort of similar to um, one game that I showed before in a lesson about space. Um, the... McDonald versus De La Bordenois or something. If I butchered the pronunciation, come hang me. Um, the similarity is that in the end, because White had such a space advantage, eventually the pawns are just running down the middle of the board. 